Hi, it's Matthew Reed here from How to Repair Pendulum Clocks with another Workshop Techniques video. Today we're going to be fitting new teeth on the great wheel of a Fusey dial clock. I hope you like the content. If you do, of course, please like and subscribe. And remember, if you use this content in your own practice, there's always super thanks as well, which is very much appreciated. I will see you at the end of the video. So here we have our uh, Fusey clock movement. Uh, pretty uh, standard fare, nice quality uh, chain driven fusey, late 19th, early 20th century. So the clock had a later mainspring which was overdriving uh, the mechanism and this later mainspring had damaged the great wheel teeth. So normally uh, with wear on teeth, which is perfectly uh, normal, it takes decades and decades in in uh, fact, uh, hundreds of years with uh, hammer-hardened brass. And what you tend to find is an increasing pressure angle between the driving pinion and the driven wheel. And basically, because this clock was overdriven, that wear of potentially hundreds of years had happened in a couple of decades or so. So um, one way to get round this is to depth the, um, the, the wheel and the pinion very close together. But you can only do that so far, and particularly with these relatively short teeth, um, because the tooth begins to jam in the root of the pinion leaf. So I tried changing the depth thing, but I couldn't get the clock to run. Uh, it was just um, binding. So my options were to make a new wheel or to cut the old teeth off and retain the core of the existing wheel with these uh, numbers that are stamped on there. So that's what I decided to do. So I uh, obviously counted the number of teeth on the wheel, which is 96, and then I calculated the module. So you may be wondering, what is module? Well, module is the name for the width of the tooth, or the value for the width of the tooth on a gear wheel at the pitch circle diameter. And you calculate module by taking the pitch circle diameter of the wheel and dividing it by the number of teeth. Remember, the pitch circle diameter is the um, theoretical working diameter of the wheel if it were a plain disc of material without any teeth on it. Uh, that's the diameter at which it operates. So if we take uh, a disc of material, a uh, pitch circle diameter of 100, 100 millimetres, and that wheel has 100 teeth on it, if we divide 100 PCD by 100 teeth, then of course we get 1. So this wheel would have a module of 1. Typically, domestic clock gears are somewhere between about 0.4 module and about 0.8 module. So let's have a quick look uh, a bit closer at our wheel of one module. If we take that pitch circle diameter and turn that into a circumference, so we times it by pi or 3.14, uh, and bearing in mind that if you've got a wheel of 100 teeth, you've also got 100 gaps. So in fact, you've got 200 units based on the fact that the tooth gap ratio is 50-50. You would have um, a, a tooth and a gap together would be 3.14 millimetres, that's a hundredth of the circumference, or half of that, the actual tooth width, would be about 1.57 millimetres. Of course, in historic clockwork, the tooth gap to tooth ratio isn't always 50-50, in fact, it's often not 50-50, but that is for another day. The last thing to remember, of course, is that when we make a tooth of a certain width, 
that it's in this case we're removing material so it's the cutter width that we're particularly interested in which leaves behind the tooth So the module is the size of the teeth, basically, and we uh, figure out or estimate, in this case, the pitch circle diameter of the wheel, that's the effective working diameter of the wheel, and then um, we're able to work out what the module or size of the teeth is, and it works out about 0.55 module. I use a commercial uh, cutter by Thornton's and um, and that appears to uh, kind of fit the, the tooth gap that exists. So again, we know we're in the sort of ballpark. If you want to know more about wheel cutting, I highly recommend the excellent publication by Malcolm Wilde, Wheel and Pinion Cutting. And if you want to know more about basic gearing and depthing, then we have an e-publication on the subject. Links in the description below. I take a piece of cast uh, brass, a wheel blank for a long case clock by the side of it that I've had a, quite a lot of years and use my piercing saw to cut out a ring of material which I then hammer harden. Um, all brass should be work hardened that's used for cutting clock wheels. Once I've done that, I calculate uh, how much I need to turn off in addition to the teeth to fit the new ring of material. And I want the, uh, the, the ring to have a base of about the same height of the, as the teeth. So it's about 50-50. Um, so I take off an additional 3.2 millimeters from the root diameter. When I machine the teeth away, I have the cross slide on the lathe set to a low angle and I'm going to use the same angle on the piece of material that I fit, which will help them fit together quite nicely. In fact, what, I, what happens is that I do this kind of too well and they're too good a fit and make a little bit of an untidy job of soldering them together.
both um, components are uh, sweated with soft solder or tinned and they're soldered together as I said I could have done with the blank being a little bit bigger diameter um, it was a bit of a squeeze to get it on there and um, the solder has kind of gone everywhere but it's only on the surface so it's uh, a strong repair The second part of the uh, process here is to also make a dividing plate. I don't have a 96 tooth dividing plate. I could of course buy one, but in the best Yorkshire fashion, I decide to make one out of this um, belt that I bought on the internet with 96 teeth on it and a piece of plywood which I fixed to the face plate of the lathe. Once we have our 96 tooth dividing uh, plate in place, I uh, can go ahead and cut the wheel teeth. Once the teeth are cut, then it's time to try the wheel and the pinion in the depthing tool 
And again, if you've got access to a depthing tool, it's incredibly useful because you can more easily see what is going on. Once I'm happy that that works, I then try the wheel and the pinion in the frame of the clock and all seems to be good. As a note, I leave the, uh, the bit that I sold it on slightly wider than the original wheel. This, uh, the pinion is nice and long, so that doesn't cause us a problem. And it means I don't have to finish onto the face of the original wheel hub. So again, trying to preserve as much material as possible. And it also makes it a very obvious repair. Um, anybody who comes along in the future can see what's happened. They might not know why that happened. And um, so it's pretty kind of transparent. I don't need to, to hide the repair. And there we are, our clock is ticking away nicely. So there we are, um, the process of uh, conservatively, if you like, replacing the teeth on a clock wheel where the wheel can't be flipped round on its arbor. So um, I showed you as much of the process as I could and some parts of it I could have probably done a little bit neater, but there you are, that is how it is. Uh, I hope you found it of interest. Please leave your comments below like and subscribe and if you uh, use this uh, information or this inspires your own practice then there's always super thanks which is really appreciated and makes all the difference so thanks see you again soon and bye for now